nicely. Okay. Yes, very nice. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank again. Thank you so much, Patrick, for the nice introduction. Um, thanks everyone for attending this online seminar here at PSRF. So before I begin with my presentation, I would like to thank my funding sources. So first, the Horizon 2020 project, especially the Marie Curie ITN for finance and the metal aid project that I was involved in, the Helmholtz Research Association, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and GUX. To begin with, um, Reactive iron bearing minerals are present in many natural and engineered environments. So for example, in hydromorphic soils, which are often poorly drained and waterlogged, um, it is characterized by this upper ochre colored mineral layer, which changes to this blue green colored gray horizon. And this color change from um, ochre to blue green signifies the change from oxidizing to reducing condition. Now this blue-green color in the gray layer has been ascribed to the presence of mixed valent iron to iron three phases. And this has been identified to be green rust or fougerie. And we can see this from the scanning electron micrograph as this hexagonal plate-like um, particle. In addition to um, hydromorphic soils, we can also find green rust in other natural uh, environments such as uh, as corrosion products for steel that is immersed in seawater. It has also been identified in iron to rich non sulfidic lakes and in anoxic or oxygen poor groundwater and aquifers. And how does it, how does it form in natural environments? So there are many pathways where greenness can form in the natural environment. So first of all, one of the possible pathways is through the precipitation pathway, which is just the direct precipitation of greenness from dissolved iron two and iron three um, to form greenness. And it needs to satisfy a specific iron ratio. So iron two and iron three should be greater than or equal to two, and it should be at circumneutral pHs. It is also possible to um, form greenness through the direct oxidation of dissolved iron two, or through the transformation of poorly ordered iron oxyhydroxide, such as ferrihydrate or schwartmanite, which in this process is often catalyzed by dissolved iron two. Now, because green rust is metastable in comparison to other iron oxyhydroxides, um, over long periods of time, it's possible that green rust transforms to other phases. So a common transformation product under anoxic and non-sulfidic conditions is magnetite. In terms of its composition, green rust is composed of iron hydroxide sheets, as we can see from this figure. So this iron hydroxide sheets is composed of both iron two in blue and iron three in orange. And in between these iron hydroxide sheets, we have anions and water molecules. Now, depending on the environment where green rust formed, this interlayer and ion can change. So it can be chloride, carbonate, or sulfate. And of course, depending on the interlayer and ion, the basal plane spacing between these iron hydroxide sheets can change. So for planar anions such as chloride and carbonate, the basal plane spacing could be somewhere between 7.5 to 7.8. And for tetrahedral um, sulfate and ion, it's around 11. And of course, this inter, um, interlayer and ion is also reflected with um, the X-ray diffraction pattern of greenness. So for example, here we have um, the X-ray diffraction pattern of greenness sulfate. And of course, the most intense reflection that we can see over here corresponds to the blames, basal plane spacing of 11 angstrom. Similar to greenness that are, that are found in natural environments, greenness that are synthesized in the laboratory also exhibit the hexagonal plate-like morphology um, that we see that we saw earlier. So here it is seen here in the scanning electron micrograph and the transmission electron micrograph. Now, what makes green rust interesting from an environmental geochemistry perspective is that it's a highly reactive mineral that can treat a wide range of pollutants. So for example, in the case of metal and metalloid contaminants, it's able to absorb um, 
uh, the contaminants in the reactive surfaces, and sometimes it can also incorporate it in its structure, either through cationic substitution by replacing um, the iron sites in the iron hydroxide sheets, or through intercalation um, by trapping it in the interlayer region. Now, because green rust contains both iron 2 and iron 3, it can also participate in redox reactions. Um, in some cases, it's able to reduce contaminants by either fully oxidizing um, its structure or by forming secondary um, iron oxyhydroxides. Through this process, it's able to convert the toxic contaminant to its less toxic form. So here we just have the periodic table of greenness, which shows you all the various elements that has been um, reacted with um, green rust. And for my research, I choose to focus with arsenic. So arsenic is still a global environmental and public health concern, and it affects 150 million people worldwide. And majority of the affected regions um, are in South and Southeast Asia. So for example, West Bengal and Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Vietnam. And what makes arsenic dangerous is that it's a tasteless, odorless, and colorless pollutant. And chronic exposure to arsenic can lead to painful skin lesions, as you can see in this image, neurodevelopmental disorders, cancer, and sometimes death. Now, in contaminated soils and groundwater, the most common form that exists is the inorganic form. So we have inorganic arsenic-3 or arsenite and inorganic arsenic-5 or arsenate. So there's a difference between these two forms such that um, arsenic-3 is more mobile and more toxic compared to the arsenic-5 counterpart. And it doesn't help that it also has a very low sorption affinity to common soil minerals. So what are the research questions? So the questions are, is green rust a potential sink for arsenic in this subsurface environments? And if it is, what is the mechanism for the immobilization of arsenic in green rust? How does it affect the formation of green rust and its transformation under these um, environments? And Ultimately, what's the fate of arsenic during this mineral transformation reactions? Now, just going back to our previous slide, so here we have the different pathways where it can form. And for this um, presentation, I will focus on the precipitation and transformation pathway. So for the precipitation pathway, I do all my experiments inside the um, anaerobic chamber or the glove box, wherein the atmosphere is composed of 97% nitrogen and 3% hydrogen. So hydrogen is there to scrub all of the oxygen that might um, penetrate the glove box through a palladium alumina catalyst. So first I start with synthesizing um, the green rust by combining um, an iron 2 and iron 3 solution. I usually have iron 2 in excess and then add sodium hydroxide until a pH of around 8. So once the green rust is formed, I add arsenic 3 or arsenic 5 and I vary several geochemical parameters. For example, I change the initial arsenic concentration, pH, ionic strength, and competing ions, and see what's the effect on this, uh, of these um, parameters on the removal. So now in order to characterize the, um, uh, the reacted solids that I have, I use a variety of techniques, but for this presentation, I will mainly focus on the following. So I use ICPOES or inductively coupled plasma, optical emission spectrometry to measure how much arsenic is removed um, from my system, uh, transmission electron microscopy to look at changes in the structure or morphology of my green rust, um, X-ray scattering to monitor also changes in structure, and X-ray absorption spectroscopy to look at the local binding environment of arsenic. So now here we have um, the adsorption isotherms for arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 on green rust. So here we have the amount absorbed and the equilibrium concentration remaining in the solution. 
So as we can see for green rust, it is able to remove both um, large amounts of arsenic-3 and arsenic-5. So for arsenic-3, it's around 160 milligrams per gram of green rust. And for arsenic-5, it's around 100 milligrams. So how does it compare to other um, iron minerals found in the environment? So here we just have a, a figure where we have the iron minerals on this right axis. And on the bottom axis, we have the surface coverage surface coverages, which is just the amount of arsenic normalized to the surface area of these mineral phases. And as you can see from this figure, greenness is among the best performing uh, minerals in terms of sequestering arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 in the environment. So now we know that greenness is an effective adsorbent for, um, for arsenic in contaminated soils and groundwater. But how does it actually do it? So here we use um, scanning transmission electron microscopy to look at the reacted green rust um, solids. So here we have a scanning transmission electron microscope image of our green rust that has been reacted with arsenic at pH. 7 at 500 ppm of arsenic-3. And here we can clearly see this dissolution bands or dissolution zone where um, green rust has been eaten away during the reaction. And at the outermost edges, we can see that there is um, uh, the, the outermost edges of the crystal are preserved. And if we look at the elemental distribution of iron, oxygen, and arsenic in our, uh, in our particle, we can see that there is an enrichment of arsenic at the particle edges. Looking at the combined maps, this makes it a bit clearer. And we can see that um, higher in signal intensity can be observed at these particle edges, which tells us that this is the preferred adsorption site for arsenic-3. Now, this is the first um, documented evidence for um, uh, or visualized binding site for arsenic-3 on green rust. And here we just have a non-negative matrix factorization image, which just highlights, again, that majority of the arsenic is found at the particle edges. Now, what we can say here is that arsenic-3 stabilized the outermost edges against crystal dissolution. It is a little bit different story when we look at the arsenic-5 reacted greenness. Now, it's, we still see some sort of crystal dissolution features here at the particle edges, but the prominent features are mainly this thread-like structures that we see over here. And if we look at the elemental maps, we see that these thread-like structures are enriched with um, arsenic and iron. And this is further evidenced by this um, combined elemental maps. And um, we can see that majority of the arsenic is at the edges and some of it also at the particle edges. Now, when we look at the high energy X-ray diffraction pattern of our reacted solids, here we just have the pure green rust. And here is the arsenic-3 reacted green rust. Here we don't see any other um, iron oxyhydroxide phase aside from green rust, but for the arsenic-5 reacted green rust, where we observe the formation of these thread like structures, we can see that there are additional reflections. And these reflections correspond to the, pyros to the phase pyrosimplicite, which is an iron to arsenic. And by making a synthetic pyrosimplicite corresponding to the conditions um, of uh, the reacted mixture, we see that we can form thread-like structures and that the EDX spectrum also shows iron and arsenic signals. Now looking at um, the arsenic K edge absorption spectroscopy of our uh, reacted samples, here we just have um, the arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 reacted green rust and also a reference parasimplicite. So for those of you that are not so familiar with X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we have two main regions um, uh, in, this, uh, in this spectra. So here we have the X-ray absorption near its structure, which gives us information on the oxidation state of arsenic and the extended X-ray absorption fine structure, which gives us information on the local binding environment. Now, zooming at the SAINS region, here we can see that arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 did not 
uh, um, really change the oxidation state after you are reacting with greenness. Now looking at the um, at the exact region of uh, the reacted solids, we don't really see so much um, information from this. So normally what we do is we take the Fourier transform of our exact region to give us a more meaningful um, description of the bonding environment. So what kind of information can we get from um, the Fourier transform excess? So here we have arsenic-3 and arsenic-5. And if we look at the first shell of our Fourier transform excess spectra, here at the first shell, this corresponds to the arsenic and oxygen um, uh, atomic pair. And based on the distance, we can differentiate whether it's arsenic-3 or arsenic-5. And we can look at the coordination number also based on the in, fitting the intensity to see if it's um, coordinated with three or four. Now the, the place where um, XFs really shines is with the second shell in, for at least for arsenic um, uh, XFs is the second shell where we can look at the arsenic iron interactions. So, Let's take arsenic-5 here as an example. So if we consider arsenic-5 as a tetrahedra, we can look at the possible binding geometries of arsenic on green rust. So here we have all the possible um, bonding environments. Here we have bidentate binuclear, we have monodentate mononuclear, we have edge sharing, and we can also form dimers. And depending on the coordination number and the distance between the arsenic and iron, we can differentiate um, among these different bonding environments. And based on the shell-by-shell -shell fittings of the uh, second shell, we have determined that for both arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, it is a double corner sharing um, bonding environment. Now looking at the arsenic-5, we can also determine how much of the arsenic-5 is sequestered as parasimplicite and how much is adsorbed as arsenic-5. And based from this, here we have a reference wherein we only have adsorbed um, green rust and here we have parasimplicite. We see that about 86% of the arsenic-5 is sequestered as parasimplicite and 14% is adsorbed as arsenic-5. So here we see that there are two different um, immobilization mechanisms for arsenic-3 and arsenic-5. If the oxidation state of arsenic is arsenic-3, it's adsorbed as inner sphere surface complexes. Whereas if we have arsenic-5, it can either be adsorbed at the particle edges or, or form parasimplicite, which is an iron arsenic. Now we know that there's a high possibility of arsenic uptake, but the next question is, is there also a possibility for remobilization? So this is now when we look at the next um, transformation, uh, next formation pathway, which is the transformation pathway. And as I've said a while ago, we start from um, poorly ordered oxyhydroxide, and in this case, we choose ferrihydride. So for the experimental setup, again, this is done inside the anaerobic chamber to prevent oxidation of green rust. So first we start with a ferrihydrate, and then after the ferrihydrate is formed, we add arsenic to the ferrihydrate. And after equilibrating it for 24 hours, it is then that we add iron 2 to trigger the transformation to green rust. Now then, once the green rust is formed, um, we look at what happens to, to the green rust solids um, as it ages. So we monitor this over a period of 30 days. So here, these are just the conditions wherein we synthesize um, uh, the green rust with, uh, with or without arsenic. In this figure, we have um, the transformation of arsenic bearing ferrihydrate with or without arsenic. So just to guide you within this, within this figure, here we have the degree of reaction, which just tells us how much of the greenness has been formed and the time in logarithmic scale to show you the reaction time. So what is the, what is the effect of arsenic? Please ignore this um, silica. Um, so the effect of arsenic is that it slows down green rust um, formation. As we can see compared to the, to, the, to the gray lines here, the 
samples that have been uh, reacted or formed with arsenic-3 or arsenic-5 are much lower in terms of degree of reaction. In addition, it also delays magnetite formation. And it is indicated here by the decrease of the um, amount of greenness formed here. And as we can see, there's also a difference between the inhibition efficiency for, um, of arsenic for greenness formation, whereas we see that um, arsenic-5 reacted greenness has transformed already during the duration of the 30 days, whereas for arsenic-3, it's still predominantly greenness. So how does it look like um, in images? So here we just have a transmission uh, scanning um, electron micrograph of our pure system. So no arsenic in the system. And here we see a combination of green sulfate as this hexagonal platelets. And we have um, magnetite nanoparticles over here. Again, going back to our X-ray absorption spectroscopy data, we want to know now what happens to the arsenic when green rust transforms to magnetite. Um, is it still safe um, in the mineral? So here again, we have the Sains region and we have the XFs region. Here we have the solids after 30 days. This is again the arsenic-5 reacted solid. And we have two references here. We have um, arsenic-5 that has been added to magnetite and a magnetite wherein the arsenic-5 is incorporated. So in this case, the magnetite form in the presence of arsenic-5. Looking at the Saints data, we don't see any changes in, um, in the oxidation state. That is at least for the observed reaction period of 30 days. In terms of the XF spectra, um, here, unlike our XF spectra before, we see some features uh, that are helpful in seeing changes in our solid. So here we can see this um, shoulders in this um, XF spectra. So these features are also present in the solids um, after 30 days, which already suggests that the local bonding environment of the arsenic in our solids after 30 days is quite similar to the arsenic five incorporated magnetite. And if we look at the Fourier transform X sub spectra of these um, solids, what we can see is that it is indeed the case that the arsenic is sequestered inside the crystal structure of magnetite. So how does this happen? So the incorporation mechanism is through the replacement of the arsenic-5 tetrahedra with the tetrahedral ion-3 um, in the magnetite structure. And here we can observe two different um, arsenic iron correlations uh, in, the, in the crystal structure of magnetite. Now, what we have observed in this, um, in, in this study is that the coordination number for both the first and the second um, arsenic iron correlation is lower than the theoretical. So the theoretical coordination environment for, uh, for this first one is 12 and this one is for 16, which should suggest that the substitution of arsenic is only partial or it could only also suggest that the substitution is not homogeneous in the crystal structure. Um, whereas majority of um, uh, the substitution can happen near the surface uh, to also preserve the charge balance of magnetite. So what is the take home message for this? Um, study. So here, what we can say is that um, for two different arsenic species, arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, there are differences in how it reacts. Whereas arsenic-3 um, uh, makes the greenness formation very, very slow, whereas it's a little bit faster um, with arsenic-5. And because the inhibition efficiency of arsenic-3 is higher compared to arsenic-5, we don't see um, the formation of magnetite within 30 days. Um, but for our study five, we see. Um, and then the most important thing to remember is that there is no arsenic remobilization, even though um, green rust has transformed to magnetite. Now, all of this is very nice. Um, we can see clearly how arsenic speciation affects um, the removal 
the binding mechanism, but also the formation and transformation of greenness. So the next thing to look at is how does it play out in um, uh, natural environments. So the next um, part of this research is to look at the long-term stability of and reactivity of greenness in the groundwater. So here we have two, um, two setups. So we have here pristine groundwater. So this is the groundwater collected from the site. So no additional arsenic present. Um, and we have the arsenic spike groundwater wherein we add six milligrams per liter or six ppm of arsenic. And we add equivalent amounts of arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 in the system. We also make a differentiation with the temperature wherein we do one experiment at 25 degrees, our room temperature, and one where we do it um, at four degrees. So the groundwater has been collected from, um, from this field site in Copenhagen. And here are the groundwater um, chemistry parameters. So what's important here is to remember that this um, groundwater has high amounts of bicarbonate in the system. So now looking at the amount of arsenic that is removed in the system, um, just to guide you again in this figure, here we, here we have the dissolved arsenic um, in our system and the aging time in terms of days. So here we have a total aging time of 120, which is equivalent to four months. As we can see from, uh, from our figure at 25 degrees, which is in this um, uh, indicated by this legend, um, the removal is uh, slow. Um, where in majority of the arsenic that has been added is only removed after 60 days and very low amounts are remaining after 120 days. Um, and this result is quite surprising because um, in our synthetic experiments where we react um, green rust with... Uh, with an ultra pure water, the, re the removal of arsenic is fast. This is true for both arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, where in majority of um, the arsenic that has been added has been removed uh, within four hours of the reaction. But in this case, it took about 60 days and 120 for the complete removal. And lower removal rates are even observed when we look at the, um, the four degrees treatment wherein we don't even remove um, all the added arsenic during the observed period of 120 days. Now, we've also left this reaction for longer periods of time. So we came back to this um, reactors after one year, and it is only then that we observe complete removal. So this also shows that temperature can also play a role in the removal kinetics of arsenic from groundwaters. Now let's look at the um, changes in the green rust solids um, in terms of composition. Again, to guide you in this figure, here we have the phase composition that we obtained from uh, ripple refinements of the XRD patterns, and we have the aging times in this. So here we have green rust sulfate and green rust carbon. And for the first 30 days, um, what happens is because the groundwater has a lot of um, bicarbonate in the system, we observe ion exchange, wherein we change um, uh, the composition from green rust sulfate to green rust carbonate through ion exchange. So we have the replacement of sulfate and the carbonate. And then after this, um, another thing that we observe here, we have the appearance of magnetite, which appears after um, 30 days. So the formation of magnetite comes at the expense of both green rust sulfate and green rust carbonate. And this transformation mechanism goes through a dissolution precipitation mechanism. Here we just have a scanning electron micrograph of our solids obtained from um, 120 days, and you can see here aggregates of magnetite nanoparticles. Now, when we age this green rust um, at four degrees, uh, we see a different story, wherein 
the ion exchange um, resulting in the conversion of greenhouse sulfate to greenhouse carbonate only happens after 30 days. So we can see that at lower temperature, this transformation pathway is already lower. And we do not observe um, green rust, uh, we don't observe magnetite formation from our XRD patterns from the nuclear refinements. However, when we look at the scanning electron micrograph of our samples after 120 days, we can clearly see that magnetite has formed. So we can say that the formation of magnetite is very, very slow, and we just don't see it because it's below the detection limit of um, X-ray diffraction. So now we look at green rust that is aged in the arsenic spike groundwater at room temperature. Um, what we see here is that it has a similar effect um, to the temperature. So the adsorbed arsenic also slows down the ion exchange for sulfate and carbonate. So the conversion is also um, slowed down. And similar to the previous um, experimental treatment, we also don't detect magnetite in the X-ray diffraction patterns. But when we look at the scanning electron micrograph, we observe mag magnetite nanoparticle aggregates. Now the next um, setup is what would be most relevant to a groundwater that has been contaminated with arsenic. So low temperature um, with arsenic that is present. And in this case, we can see that the conversion is very, very slow and we almost retain um, green rust sulfate in our system even after 120 days. And this is also evident, evidence by the thin um, hexagonal platelets of green rust in the system. So what is the take home message of um, this research? or this, this part of the project. So here we have the rate of transformation and the aging time as well as the removal rate. So as we age our green rust at ambient temperature without the presence of arsenic, we slowly transform that to magnetite. Um, and if we have low temperature or if arsenic is present in the system, this transformation rate is even slower. And if we combine the low temperature and the absorbed arsenic, this effect is even compounded wherein we don't see um, uh, the conversion of green rust to magnetite um, uh, at low temperature and absorbed arsenic conditions. So what are the main findings of this research? So just to summarize it, here we have shown that green rust can remove large amounts of both arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, and that green rust is among the best performing iron-bearing mineral phases. And the mechanism involved in um, the immobilization of green rust depends on arsenic speciation, wherein you mainly have adsorbed arsenic species if you have um, arsenic-3, or if you have arsenic-5, you can also form secondary iron arsenic um, phases such as parasimplicite. And we have shown that arsenic bearing green rust is stable under um, geochemical conditions that we have tested relevant to natural groundwater conditions. And that we don't expect arsenic remobilization even after long aging times. So um, as far as ongoing work, this project is part of the Metal Aid project, which is a Marie Curie ITN, um, which um, looks at creating um, mineral-based technologies for treating groundwater pollutants. So my part of the project concerns metal contaminants, but from our project, we also deal with um, organic pollutants. And here we have, this is just a photo of our, um, uh, latest um, experiment where we tried to inject our mineral-based particles in a simulated um, groundwater aquifer to look at the mobilization of these particles um, in a porous media. Now, in terms of um, uh, drinking water treatment technologies, a collaborator of mine has also implemented um, green rust in terms of removing 
um, arsenic contaminants for drinking water um, in West in West Bengal and Bangladesh through electro through the process of electrocoagulation. Now, from the geological um, point of view, another thing that we are exploring is the question whether green rust is an important iron mineral in early Earth oceans. And if it is, was it a sink for arsenic and or phosphorus um, under these conditions? And this is being explored because um, the early Earth conditions before oxygen was present in our ocean is very much similar to the conditions where green rust formed in the present. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I would like to thank the following people. First, my um, supervisor, Leanne G. Benning, and the rest of um, the members of my research group here at GFS at Potsdam, the Interface Geochemistry section. Um, my co-supervisor, Dominic Tobler from the University of Copenhagen, and the rest of the members of the Metal Aid Network, Helen Freeman, and um, the people from the Leeds Electron Microscopy and Spectroscopy group at Leeds University in the UK, and um, Dr. Case Van Hinochen and Knud Dirksen from um, the, the Geological Survey for um, Denmark and uh, Greenland. I would also like to thank funding acknowledgement, of course, from Horizon 2020, from Helmholtz Research Association, from the Oral Society of Chemistry, GUX, and of course, this research would not be possible if not for the awarded beam times from um, the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. Thank you so much, and I welcome questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, 